Come back down by the water again. I love being next to the water, particularly the sea. And I really, really love this place because we've got these splendid rocks sort of curving up around this little bay and the Isle of Wight off in the distance. And there's a little sort of promontory sticking out of the shingle bank. This sort of shot would make a great panoramic image. Now, when you're going to shoot a panoramic image, conventional wisdom says you reach for the wide angle lens. Let's give that a go and just sort of see what that looks like. So it doesn't really matter what mode, I'm just going to use a smallish aperture so we've got a, uh, as much depth of field as possible. Now then, I'm going to line up the shot, we've got some rocks down here. I'm just going to shoot a picture, I need to be a little bit closer, focus it and line up the horizon and take a shot. Now that is quite a pleasant image and to make a panoramic you'd just want to take the top and the bottom off just like that. Yes, it's okay, but when I look at this, the kind of shingle bank, it's disappeared. The little promontory sticking out there, the Isle of Wight, it's, it's gone off. I don't know where it's gone, because standing here I can see it, so why can't I see it in my picture? It's because wide angle lens, lenses expand perspective. Things that are further off get pushed further away. So therefore, I'm not really getting a true representation of what I'm looking at. But what if I told you I could take the same picture and it would look like this? Now you can see the sweep of the bay, you can see the rock sticking out, the Isle of Wight in the distance. So how on earth did I do it? That second image was shot with a long lens. And the long lens has compressed the perspective and brought everything all close up together. It sucked the Isle of Wight up a bit closer. But how can you do that? Because a wide lens has got this great big wide field of view, whereas a long lens has a very shallow, narrow field of view. It's a bit like looking down a drain pipe. Well, what you can do is join a load of images together. So by taking lots of images with a long lens all the way across the scene and then joining them together, stitching them together, you end up with one panoramic image. For me, the big advantage of this is because I can make the picture look how I want it to. I can use that perspective of a long lens and get exactly the way I find it to be pleasing. There is another advantage too, and that's pixels. If you've got a 12 megapixel camera and you shoot with a wide lens and then cut, say, 25% off the top and the bottom, you're going to end up with a 6 megapixel image. If you wanted to blow that up big and stick it on the wall, it's probably going to fall apart because there aren't that many pixels to work with. However, if you have 12 megapixels and you take 10 images as a panoramic and join them together, 10 times 12, you've got a 120 megapixel image. Now, it won't be exactly 120 megapixel images because they're going to overlap, but you get my point. Now, there are two stages to making a pan stitch image, as they're called. One is in the shooting, and one is in the joining together in Photoshop. So let's look at them in two parts. First off, let's get on and I'll show you how to go about shooting a pan stitch. So get out your long lens and stick it on your camera body. I'm going to set the zoom to 135 millimeters for this shot because that will compress that perspective. It'll draw the distance in much, much closer. When I took the wide angle shot, I was over here standing quite close to the rocks. The reason being the wide angle was sort of picking up from down here to up there. But because the magnification and shallow sort of field of view that you have, the narrow field of view you have with a long lens, I'd only be able to see just that bit of rock because of the magnification. So I've got to move myself back to start taking this shot with the long lens. We've got my tripod over here. You're going to need a tripod, a sturdy tripod because long lenses magnify movement and vibration. So the sturdier and heavier your tripod is, the better. Also, we're gonna take vertical slices instead of taking horizontal ones because this, this lens is only gonna see a little kind of slice like this, whereas the light wide one is seeing something like that. So to maximize what we're seeing up and down, we're gonna put the camera on its side. Vertical slices, like bits of bread. I'm using my professional 2.8 lens. The reason for that is it has this ring mount and, and the, the camera will pivot, sorry, the lens will pivot around this point here, which is kind of called the nodal point of the lens if you want to get into it. This allows me to rotate it on that mounting ring so that the camera is always pivoting around the same point. 
like that. If I were to use my consumer lens, you can still do this by the way with a consumer lens, but it might be harder to join things together. I've got to bring that out here. Now with my tripod head, that is particularly tricky. Look at the distance. The camera is no longer above the center of the tripod. It's now over here. So as I pan, look, the back of the camera is moving around all over the place. Instead of staying here and panning like that, we're kind of rotating around the point, which could make it more difficult to join your images up later on. I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm saying it might be trickier. Also, a ball head tripod is one of the most tricky ones to use for this sort of thing because it's very hard to get this part of the tripod to line up perfectly with the base. Right, next stage, let's get my camera vertical and I am using my 2.8 lens. I've got a little spirit level bubble on here to try and help me get things level, but there is no substitute for having the grid display on in your viewfinder and using the little lines that come in to line it up with the horizon. I'm gonna put the horizon, the C, on those two little lines so that I know each shot is in the same place. If your camera's pointing up, then down, then it's twisted, then it's that way, it's gonna be much, much more difficult to join the images together. You might have gaps. Just have a quick look through. There we go, that's pretty good. The next thing I want to talk to you about is your aperture, your depth of field. There's quite a lot to this, isn't there? You need to use a small aperture with the long lens. Short lenses have an inherently large depth of field. Long lenses are much, much shallower with their depth of field. So I'm gonna use an aperture of F18. That's gonna give me as much depth of field as possible, but it still won't be front to back sharpness. So I'm gonna to have to focus in different places. When the rocks are in the foreground, I will be, photogra I will be photographing, focusing about 10 or 15 feet into those rocks. Then as we move across and we're going more into the background of the shot, I'll start focusing a bit further away each time. And I'm gonna do it with the autofocus just by moving the little, you know, the dot, the gun sight across a single point or focus. Because of the long lens and the small aperture, I'm going to be end up, I'm going to be end up, I'm going to end up with quite a slow shutter speed. Another reason for needing a very sturdy tripod to do this, because long lenses can suffer from camera shake. We don't want that to happen. We don't want a fuzzy, blurred image. When it comes to your exposure, do it manually. It's another thing to think about. This is quite a complex technique, isn't it? If you're using an auto exposure mode, what will happen is when your camera points at something dark, the exposure system in the camera will try and brighten it up. You'll think, that's too dark, I need to brighten it a bit. And as you move across the scene, if there's something bright there, it will darken it. So where you have sky, instead of it kind of like going across in a nice steady, even, tone what will happen is you'll have a bright bit and a dark bit and a bright bit and a dark bit and you'll never get all those different images to marry up so you do have to kind of wait for the light to be consistent set your exposure manually and find one that works across the scene so i would shoot across here to the towards these rocks right now my light meter says i want a 25th of a second well that's okay so let me just take a quick test exposure looking in the back of the camera check my histogram that looks pretty good over there, let's just try that same exposure, pointing the camera. Well, actually, I'm going to go down the beach because there's a bit of white foam on the water. And I want to just see. Look at that, the sun just came out. I don't know if you noticed that. So that's the sort of thing you have to look for because if the sun comes out halfway through your exposure, you're stuffed. You're actually going to have to wait and start again until it's the same light across the whole thing. Any minute now, it's going to go behind, the, behind that cloud. So. It will do that. But anyway, manual exposure and check it one step at a time. Yep, that'll be okay. So there we go. That's all the camera stuff set up. Now it's about where do you point the camera to start joining it all together. You've got to make sure that your images overlap. I would say allow at least 25% of the edge of the frame to overlap. So you've got, I don't know, this much here needs to overlap here. So in the first shot, I'm going to use, let's say I'm going to use this rock here, that one. 
if that's on the left hand side of the frame in the first first shot sorry on the right hand side of the frame in the first shot when I move the camera across for the next shot that has to be in the left hand side of the frame so that the computer will go oh yes that's the same rock and it will overlay it together therefore building the picture that's what you have to look for so kind of like so that will be uh, on the right in the first shot on the left in the second and then I'll look for something else which could be the top of this rock which will be on the right in the first and then on the left in the second you see what I mean look for things in the landscape that you can overlay so that your images line up properly right actually we've got a nice little gap in the light I'm going to see what we can do to shoot this one straight away hello right so we've got the that's all set up. We're looking straight through here. I've focused into those rocks about eight or 10 feet. We'll just let these people go through and then we'll fire it, fire it away. There we go, marvelous. So I'm using a release simply because I don't want to cause any vibration and I've also got my camera set on lock up. So first shot, lock up that and squeeze it the second time and it takes an image. Looking in the back, I can see where my rocks are. Move the camera across a little bit. Take the next shot. Check where the focus point's gonna be. Perfect. Take the next shot. You gotta try and do this before the light changes. Move across a little bit. And I'm focusing a little bit further up into the bay. There's the next shot. And off to the right a bit more. I'm just looking at the rocks at the bottom. That's good. We're now starting to get the little promontory over there, sort of, yeah, well, I don't know, it's a promontory, some more rocks. That's probably the best word. Right, move across there. Focus on them. Squeeze that shot. And I'm going to go one more to the right. Just need to check my horizon level because my tripod isn't 100% straight. And there we go. So we've, we've shot a load of slices of bread. Bam, 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 across there like that. And we're gonna go and join those together in a while. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified each time we upload one of our cool photography videos, or for more great photo tips, workshops, and training, come and see us at our website, photographycourses.biz.